Welcome to Bible Tract Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracts Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher is the director of Bible Tracts, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracts Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracts and supplying them to churches, missionaries, and individuals all over the world, and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample pack of our tracts will be given at the end of this broadcast. Now for our Bible study, here is our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. Hello, my friend. Welcome to the program today. I'm so glad you've joined us. If it's possible right now, reach over, get your Bible, and turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. My Bible's open there. Please, if at all possible, get your Bible and join me there. The verse we're going to look at is critical for one key point that we're going to talk about today. Also, get something on which you can jot some notes. Not so much for an outline today, but I hope you'll jot down some cross references and put time in going further with what we talk about today. So get your Bible, get something on which you can jot some notes. And by the way, with that pen and paper handy, when we give our contact information here at the end of the program, you'll be able to jot down how to contact us. We want you to give us, please, your name and mailing address so that I can send to you free of charge a sample packet containing one each of our gospel tracts. I've got one of those tracts, a testimony track in front of me. I'll tell you about it here in a moment, but let me lead into our Bible study this way. You do know what I mean by the term Great Commission, correct? The last thing Jesus told his disciples before he ascended back into heaven was that they were to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, to every person. Because of that statement, we can conclude that all people in all places and in all generations were on the heart of Christ when he said that. So as the old saying goes, you and I cannot tell the gospel story to a wrong person. But there has been a debate among good and godly people over the centuries concerning the issue of just what is the extent of the price Jesus paid there on Calvary's cross. Some good godly believers say that Jesus paid a price that not only was enough for all sinners, but that he actually did die for all sinners. Then other, again, very godly folk say that Jesus' sin payment was certainly enough, but that Jesus only died really for those who would ever get saved. Now, lest you think this is a non-issue or a, a minuscule issue, please think again. Major books have been written on this topic, and more often than not, you'll hear people call this debate a debate between limited and unlimited atonement. Well, the text before us today in 2 Peter hits squarely on this topic. So, the question today is this, for whom did Christ die anyway? Get your Bible and join me, please. I mentioned the gospel tract here a moment ago. That word tract is spelled T-R-A-C-T. You'll need that spelling if you ever go to our website. But this gospel tract, and by the way, a gospel tract is simply a short written presentation of God's plan of salvation. This particular gospel tract has a one word title. It's entitled Transformed. Transformed. And as I said earlier, it's a testimony track, a testimony of a man named Don Price who came to Christ while in prison. He was in prison because he deserved to be there. He earned the right to go there. He was a scoundrel. He was an alcoholic. He was a thief. He had taken drugs, you name it. This guy had done it. And he went to prison where he learned how to be a better thief and so on from the other prisoners. It's amazing how all the guys that get caught know how to do it better. I've never quite figured that one out. But there in prison, actually while in solitary confinement, he hears a man reading the Bible. Let me read you part of his testimony. He is in a church service. He is listening to the gospel about sin. He says this, and I'm quoting now, suddenly the weight of my sins pressed upon me until I wished I were dead. I thought about the heartache and the misery I had brought upon my wife and children and how I was treading the Son of God under my feet. 
As the service went on, a blind girl sang the song, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. That's when his resistance broke down. He said this, and I'm quoting again, swim, sink, or die. It's all the way with God. I'd rather die than live like this, end quote. It's a powerful testimony, and Don became a powerful preacher of the gospel. I want to give you this track. Would you let me please? At the end of the program, my announcer will give our contact information, or you can, as I said, go to our website, which is BibleTracksInc.org. Well, the one verse we're looking at, verse 1 out of 2 Peter 2, says this, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction." All this week, I have been using the word apostate, and every day I've given a two-statement description of what an apostate is. Number one, an apostate is a religious teacher who teaches error. Number two, an apostate is a teacher who does know what the Bible says, what Bible truth is, but they willfully and knowingly turn away and reject it. And my focus today is not to deal with apostates, but on a disagreement between fellow believers. If a person is teaching error, I don't want him or her teaching in my church. You don't want them teaching in your church. But if a believer disagrees with me on the topic of Jesus' shed blood and for whom he died, well, I can have really sweet fellowship with that person. But here in verse 1 of 2 Peter 2, it talks about false teachers. These are apostate teachers. But verse 1 says that, and I'm saying here, I'm going to quote here, that these teachers, and I'm quoting now, are even denying the Lord that bought them. Notice the word bought there. Now, if you do a serious search in your Bible, you're going to find some verses which really do seem to say that Jesus died only for those who would get saved. As you read verses, you're going to find places like Hebrews 9.28. You ought to write that one down, Hebrews 9.28, and jot this one down, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. And as you're going to read these, you'll find that Jesus gave his life for, and the word is, many. It doesn't say all. It says the word many. But then there are other verses which do say that Christ died for all and does not use the word many. It uses the word all. Jot this reference down. It's Romans 5, 18. And here's another one. 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6. So when you and I have seemingly competing verses about what they're saying in this regard concerning Christ's atonement, what are we supposed to be doing? Well, here's what I do. I look for verses that give me the clearest and the sharpest information on the extent of Jesus' sin payment. Our verse here, 2 Timothy, Peter chapter 2 verse 1 is one of the clearest and sharpest places I have found in all the Bible. Here it says that the people being spoken about are clearly not born again. They're false teachers. They are active deniers of Jesus. But as you heard me read there in verse 1, if your Bible's open, you saw it there, that Jesus bought them. The word is bought. He bought them. You have to come to a decision here. Either these false teachers are saved because Jesus bought them, or they are lost sinners for whom Jesus paid a sin-paying price. The word bought here is the very word translated redeem in other Bible passages. People are saved. They are redeemed through the blood of Christ. The word that's used here is also translated as redeemed over in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9. And there it's very definitely people that are saved. They are redeemed, bought by Jesus's blood. That's what it says there. But here, back again to verse 1 of chapter 2, we have, as I see it, lost sinners who knowingly reject the truth, but a purchase price for their salvation has been paid. This verse, and there's another one, 1 John 2, verse 2, our verse and 1 John 2, 2 are the two most significant Bible verses that help me to come to my 
personal conclusion. You don't have to agree with me. I don't have to agree with you. I'm just saying that these are the verses that caused me to come to my personal conclusion. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, there it says that Jesus is the propitiation. He's the sin satisfaction for our sins. The word our referring to believers. He is the propitiation for our sins and not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world, end quote. Now, when Christ died on the cross, his shed blood was a payment, a ransom, a paying price. He paid the price to pay for all sins by all sinners of all time. No one is exempt from this payment. There's no other way for the sins to be paid for. But as you've already know, the sin payment by Jesus only takes effect, only impacts those who have these events, these things happen in their life. If you've got your pen and paper handy, jot down these four things. Number one, what has to happen for the sin payment to come and be effective in your life, in my life, in the life of your neighbor? Number one, the gospel story must be told to the sinner. You can't get saved if you don't know the gospel. You've got to know about Jesus and his death at Calvary. That's number one. Number two, When the sinner hears the gospel, he must have the blindness of Satan removed by the Holy Spirit so they can understand the gospel story. Hearing the story is important. You've got to have that. But understanding the story is second. That part comes by the Holy Spirit. The third thing has got to happen is when the sinner is convicted about their sin and they realize they stand condemned before God. They hear the gospel, they understand the gospel, and all of a sudden they said, oh, I'm the sinner that this gospel story is about. And then number four is this, the sinner then believes into Jesus. They receive Jesus by faith as their Savior. I know the facts of the story I'm about ready to tell you. I know the facts very well. There was this bag lady in New York City who was notorious for begging for money. She was a panhandler. She lived in a cruddy apartment, one-room apartment. Well, when she died, the landlord went in to clean out her room. There he found three bags of money. And altogether, there was almost $100,000 in these three bags. She lived a beggar's life because, frankly, because of her emotional and mental state, she didn't understand the value of money. Friend, there's a whole lot of people who have heard Jesus that he died on the cross to be their savior, but they are spiritual beggars. They are dead in their sins it's because they fail to grasp, number one, the danger of their sinful state, and number two, the value and the ability of Jesus' shed blood to pay their sin debt. Friend, if you've never made Jesus your savior, you are dead in sin and on your way to hell. Don't go there. The sin payment's been made for all, including your sin. Oh, please, make Christ your Savior today, right now. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Tract Echoes. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of our tracks, you can contact us by calling 309-828-6888. Our mailing address is Bible Tracks. P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. Again, our phone number is 309-828-6888. And our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. You can also contact us through our website. Our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember, the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. That address is BibleTracksInc.org. May the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.